Greetings from Carl Berner, Oslo, and welcome to this uh, studio release. Uh, today I'm going to present um, uh, work number 311 in my body of work. Uh, the title of this work is uh, uh, Swipe 2311-20. So uh, that's a date uh, at the end there. And uh, I made this work uh, in, a, in a particular way. Uh, it's, a it's a striped work with uh, four stripes on. And I made these stripes um, with, the, with a special tool. Um, the, and that tool was my Visa card, my credit card. I used it to make three stripes, four stripes in the, in the wet filler, uh, like I was swiping it. When you, uh, like you do, uh, do when you pay something in the stores. Uh, of course, nowadays we usually use this tapping, uh, electronic tapping, but uh, recently we used this swiping motion uh, when we paid something in the store with, uh, with our credit card. And uh, not only that, uh, uh, the four uh, different stripes uh, were also placed according to um, my use of the Visa card uh, on a specific date. I choose the date randomly uh, using a random number generator and it um, turned out to be the 23rd of November last year. And then I checked my bank statement for any Visa withdrawals I did that day and it was four of them. Uh, and uh, then I used also the timestamp for these uh, um, transactions. Um, I divided the, 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 the field of the, of the work in, in according to minutes on, on a time axis going from left to right. So it's 24 hours and uh, 1460 minutes. Uh, so every minute was a little less than one millimeter. Uh, and then I could place these stripes exactly uh, according to, to how I used the Visa card on that specific day. So this was the background for this work. And uh, now I think we're just going to head on uh, straight to showing it. Uh, I just want to say it is a, also a Res Ipsa work in my Res Ipsa compilation, um, meaning that it's works made straight into the wet filler, like an traces and evidence of something that happened, that the filler is working in a way as a recording machine. Okay, let's uh, take the cover off and, and, and look at this work. Yes, this is how it looks. So you can um, see here the first transaction was here. Slightly, this is 12 o'clock right in the middle uh, because it's 12 o'clock in the night here and 12 o'clock in the night here. So one transaction in the, um, in the I don't know, around 11 o'clock maybe or nine, uh, something like that. And two slightly uh, around midday and one in the afternoon. So this is probably my, my coffee uh, that I have every morning at the coffee shop uh, and the other some, some groceries perhaps. Yes, um, I want to say something a little bit about why I wanted to do this work. Um, I'm interested in, uh, in money and transactions and um, the economic, how the e economic um, uh, economics uh, uh, affects our life in a, in a major way. Maybe that's the most important thing actually that determines uh, everything how we live our lives, uh, at least to a certain aspect. Um, yeah, so money and transactions in a way, uh, usually we think of that that it creates a distance between us. Uh, and that's right, it, it does, because 
um, every time you, you, you we, we, um, we uh, um, use money uh, to negotiate our rela uh, relationship, we kind of distance ourselves a little bit from that person, you might say. Um, and in, in, a, in, an, a friend, in a friendship or in a love relationship, uh, it's usually we are, at least uh, uh, in the Western sense of it, we see that money should, money, uh, where money comes into the equation, it kind of creates a distance between two persons. So in that sense, uh, when we swipe the card, we create like a cut between ourselves and the, and the outside world. So this could be like visualized with these cuts through the field here. But uh, we can also look at um, economic transactions in a totally opposite way also, that it kind of connects the alienated subject with the world, because we are as subjects uh, disconnected from the material world in, uh, in a primor primordial sense. Um, we, we, we see ourselves as, as uh, self-aware, uh, self-conscious subjects um, that kind of, uh, and to do that we, we have to see ourselves as in a way disconnected from the outside world, otherwise we wouldn't be um, individuals with, with a, a free will and, and able to make free choices if, we, if there were some uh, un, if there was, if, if we were connected to the outside world in a, in in a, in a in a way like with no real gap there, uh, we also would be uh, depending on the outside world, and we wouldn't be free individual subjects, in a sense. So, but with money and economic transactions, we kind of interact with this outside world. So, in a sense it kind of connects us to the world. And, and in a more sense, what economic transactions is, is transactions with money, right? And what does money mean? What is money representing? Um, in the beginning, when we had money, when we introduced money, money would be represented by like a gold amount that was inside the national bank. But we have left that system now and money is more floating. Uh, but we can still say, I think, that money in a way represents human work. That we, when we do labor and work, we get paid for that, uh, right? And um, we use that money to buy stuff. And when a, a person running a business, he need uh, something to done, he, he can employ an, uh, an person pay him money to do the to do the work uh, so we can say that all money that exists in some in, in some sense comes from human labor from from work um, and what is work work is uh, effort over time right and it, it's the things we do that kind of affects the outside world so it has a strong materiality to it uh, there's no work done if, it, if nothing is changed in the outside world. So money in that sense represents, has a big material aspect to it. Um, so we can say well, by using money, we in a, in a, in a sense kind of uh, connects ourselves with the material world in a, in a, in a greater sense. And, um, and um, yeah, like, uh, like when you say something, it doesn't. Ha it maybe doesn't have a lot of effect on the world. When you, when I say something, it's just words, right? But when I use money, I can put more power be behind my words. Wor words I can make easier, make bigger changes into the world with with the use of money. So we can say that we use the the language of money is a more powerful language than language in itself, even though money is a very abstract uh, thing uh, and, the, and the, the economic language is more abstract than the common language we use every day. I think this is interesting, these two uh, kind of uh, 
paradoxical, paradoxical uh, things about uh, the relationship between the, the human subject and, and, and uh, the economic between and money and economic transactions. Uh, so this is um, one of the reasons why I wanted to do this work about uh, economic transactions. And of course, um, this, an artwork has a special status also as, as a piece, um, as an eco economic thing. Uh, because usually as artists we sell our work to collectors people buying artworks um, and, and collecting art. Of course, we also sell work of art for people who just want them on their walls to kind of, um, um, for different needs. Maybe they want something nice with a sofa, but some, maybe they want a, uh, an artwork that they could they'd give them nice thoughts and, and, and feelings, and they want to have it in, 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 in their, life so they can reflect on it and, and experience it many times over and over again. But this still, uh, it still has in that sense a, a utilizing function. Uh, they, you use the artwork either for an, to get an art experience or for decoration or kind of uh, to make your life a better place, I hope. Uh, but there's a little bit of difference with, with an art collector. An art collector is collecting um, the work not, for, not for, uh, for the use value of it, but for the sake of, uh, of owning it. Of course, many collectors also uh, collect art as a, as for, the, for the exchange value, for the, because as, as, a, as a piece of uh, an object that they can sell and trade with to, to kind of to make money. Uh, that's also an aspect of, of, of art, of course. Uh, but I guess for a, for a true collector or what you will call it, that was didn't collect to get richer, but collected uh, art because for the love of, of the art and for the love of having an art collection, he would kind of collect for the, for the sake of owning in itself. And this kind of is parallel also to how, how the artists work, because the, art, the artist has to do, can have many reasons to do an artwork, of course. It could be something uh, that soothes you and, and makes you feel good to do art, and that's why you do it. Uh, or you can have an urge to be recognized as an important artist, or you can even want to get famous and make a lot of money. And all these things could be uh, uh, reasons to do art, but they are not enough. If you want to be an, to do good and interesting art, you have to do art for the for the art itself. Uh, there can cannot be uh, a, um, a utilizing uh, function, utilize function to, to do art, because uh, uh, then it then it doesn't function as a as a true true artwork. If there's not a dimension of this kind of um, that you do art for art itself or for to just um, investigate in what art is in a sense. Um, so that's a parallel between doing art and creativity in that sense and, and collecting art. Uh, so and this to be a collector you kind of also have to buy art so this transaction is part of of collecting art and, and in, in that sense this relationship between the artist and the collector is, is a relationship of transactions also. So that's uh, another aspect of this work I guess. Um, yes um, and I wanted to say something more about, uh, about the stripes here uh, because I've been working uh, a lot with uh, abstract uh, striped uh, stripe paintings before uh, vertical lines, uh, 
in the beginning when I started doing work painting I, I, I used I used photographs um, as a starting point for my work and uh, and I kind of used the photographs quite um, I projected the image and I followed the traced the, the contours of the of the photo to kind of make an image uh, and uh, after a while I kind of um, lo lost interest in this and I wanted to move further and I discovered a way of uh, that I could just use one stripe one no one one line from a photograph one one like pixel row from a photograph uh, and then I could uh, extend that pixel row in, in the opposite direction and, and then create a striped image from that. It's a little bit complicated to explain, but if you have like, you take just one thin, thin slice of an image and then you, and then there are of course kind of changes through the, that uh, horizontal line where it's, where it's one color and another color and then you extend, extend these changes downwards, it will create a striped image and this technique I used to to make abstract images for a long time um, and what's interesting about that I think it's is that one it's this an image is a two di dimensional thing right uh, but one just one uh, row with one axis is that's a one dimensional image you might say that have changes only in one direction, not in two directions. You have changes over a horizontal or a vertical, but not both. So there, there are, you can say, some cuts in the, in the uh, direction of this one dimension image, if you could call the one dimensional image. Uh, and and then you could like what, what you do when you extend these cuts uh, and extend this uh, uh, this one dimensional image you you put the same image one dimensional image over and over again on top of each other each other so you kind of make a, a, a fake three dimension uh, fake two dimensional image out of a one dimensional image you kind of extend the one dimension into two dimensions but it's in a, in a in a kind of a four way in a fake way because nothing else is kind of happening You're just repeating the same one dimensional image over over and over again and this kind of repetition like something that, that had kind of uh, uh, got stuck in one position uh, was interesting to me and that's why i did this striped image because I felt that it was, it was something about time here. When you kind of repeated something over and over again, it kind of a sh showed a sort of a timeline in a sense, but in a, a timeline that didn't change, that was the same over and over again. And you can also, in a, ma in a sense, make a fake three-dimensional uh, Represent, representation out of a two-dimensional one. Uh, this this you do like when, if I could like take this image for example with the stripes here and kind of extend the same in, image out in the third dimension but never changing it. These lines would like look like kind of uh, walls or something, uh, plates that kind of extended out here. Um, and this is exactly what this image is, even though not so very, this is an intersection from a three-dimensional surface that actually continues six millimeters into the image. So in a, in a sense, this is a kind of, in the same way, um, three-dimensional fake version of a two-dimensional, actual two-dimensional uh, um, Plane because there is no nothing really two-dimensional in this world, right? We, we live in a three-dimensional world, and a, and a two-dimensional, a complete two-dimensional world is just a math mathematical abstract uh, thought thing that 
doesn't really exist. Um, and th these things I think is, uh, is very interesting uh, to work with. And this another aspect here, well, I mentioned time before that this stripes kind of look like this, the time element into it. And in a sense, I feel also this is kind of uh, expressed through the, um, through the cracks here. Because when I do the work, uh, the, the, the filler slowly dries and cracks up. So the drying process is kind of visualized here. This, the time element of this work is visualized through the cracks. So you, we can say that when we see this image, this is also a sort of a uh, three-dimensional representation of a four-dimensional uh, happening. Uh, because in many sense, time is the fourth dimension that we really can't see in a sense, because we experience all, all, always uh, time in just through one now. But there are many nows uh, uh, repeated after, uh, or they are not repeated, but they're continuously placed on top of each other. So this time um, um, dimension to reality is in a sense uh, captured here in, in the cracking uh, of, the, um, of the filler, of the material I used. Um, Yes, so they, these things I, I was thinking a lot about when I did these striped paintings. So in, 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 a, sen in a way, the, this work is kind of a, a, a revisiting these this problem, problems of, of, of uh, art and of uh, this problem of, of reality that, I, that I'm really interested in. Yes. I'm going to show you some um, close-ups of, of this work, and then I think we are finished. This is the work from the side, yes. Here you can see the cracks, the stripes. You can see that there are small bubbles and things going on and uh, my works kind of disintegrate in, in some sense when you get close to them and I think this, uh, this uh, disintegrating of the image uh, uh, when you get close to it, I think that's an interesting part. Okay, so this is uh, number 311, uh, swipe 231120. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.